The first thing that I want to talk about today is bug hunting and vulnerabil vulnerability disclosure. So we covered it previously. So last semester, uh, we were talk you know, I mentioned a little bit about vulnerability disclosure and some of the options that you have in terms of how what you do when you discover a new vulnerability. But I want to go back to that um, just because there, you know, it's likely, it's fairly likely, I like to think, that you guys are going to be discovering new security vulnerabilities and problems as you go on with your degree. And now's a good time to remind you about like what the acceptable way of dealing with things are when you discover new security problems. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that and also talk about bug bounty programs, so ways that you can actually make some money doing um, security testing and um, even as a student like yourselves, uh, if you're enjoying working through the web security challenges, there's a good chance you could apply those the skill sets that you're developing in this module to make yourself a bit of money on the side. Um, and so I want to talk about that um, and partly because there are some um, gray areas and things that we need to be aware of and to make sure that you guys don't end up in jail, basically. So just now's a good time to like remind you about that stuff. So obviously we want to avoid introducing bugs into software in the first place. We would prefer not to have secure, like insecure, vulnerable software. So if you're in charge of developing software or part of a team that's developing software, there's things that you can do to minimize the chance that you are going to introduce a security problem when you're programming or designing the thing. And part of that is making sure that you are thinking about security when you're designing the system. And we'll talk about that some more next, some, next year, about um, ways that you can design systems to be more secure and ways of modeling a system to figure out where security problems might exist. So we'll come back to that later in the degree. Um, but it's important to realize that that is an important step in developing software and also testing. So during software testing, you can look for security problems. Basically, you try and break your software. Um, but even um, once software has been released, there's a number of ways you can look for security problems. <clears throat> and you, know, you may or may not have access to source code. And depending on whether or not you've got access to the source code is slightly going to change the approach that you take when you're doing your security testing. So you guys know this already, um, but a zero day vulnerability is a vulnerability that has been discovered by someone, but that hasn't been patched yet. There's no, no, there's no current fix to fix the security problem. So for example, if you discover some new security vulnerability, it is a zero day until someone does something about that vulnerability. Uh, and if you, if you use that zero day, you could do a lot of damage. You know, if you misuse that privilege that you have, you know, that information, you can basically attack systems with, with a zero day. <clears throat> but when you discover new security problems, um, there's a number of ways that you can go about disclosing that information. There's a responsible disclosure or coordinated disclosure where you basically contact the people, the vendor first, so the, say the authors of the software, for example, and you say, I've just found this security problem. You might want to know about it. Um, and you know, as we mentioned last semester, you might basically give them a time limit and say, OK, I found a security problem. You know, that in 60 days time, I'm going public. So deal with it. Like, you need to fix the problem before then. Um, and there, there's a lot of, uh, basically, it's been a heated debate within the security industry for decades, but this has been established as the answer. It's basically responsible disclosure where we give people a chance to fix it before we release the details. Um, but there's some, it doesn't relate exactly the same for websites, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Full disclosure is when we go public with the information straight away. Basically, we find a security problem and we just publish it on the online. We publish to a blog and say, I just found the security problem. This is what it is. And this is how you break all of these systems that exist. Um, it gets things fixed really quickly. But obviously, the downside is that you're making systems essentially more vulnerable, or you're disclosing vulnerability to the public, which means they're more likely to be attacked. 
um, and you know until it gets fixed. So responsible disclosure is generally the way that you do things, except that you know as I was saying, for websites it doesn't work exactly the same way, um, and that is because a, a website. Uh, if you haven't been given permission to test that website in the first place, you're probably acting illegally. Um, and so in terms of while you're studying um, here at Leeds Becker or, or when you're studying any of my modules at least, we've got a vulnerability disclosure policy that you can follow. And if you follow the vulnerability disclosure policy, then we can help. Uh, basically, it's designed to help you to, to make your way through this quite kind of complicated um, issue to get get things resolved. So, <clears throat> and depending on whether or not you're attacking something that you've installed on your own system, will be a different process to if you're in, if you're attacking a website. So, if you want to do something other than what I'm about to explain, then please talk to me first. Um, so, you know, if you found some something and you, you're thinking of doing something different, then you know, I suggest you come and talk to me about it. So if you've discovered a vulnerability in some software that you've installed on your own system, then it's a great time. It's, you know, that is fantastic, that's great news. Um, we can do all kinds of things to pressure the vendor. You can apply the time limit. Um, and basically, the, there's, it, there's not many laws that you can break when you're attacking your own system. Unfortunately, that this doesn't apply if you're attacking someone else's website. But so if you're if and this includes websites that you can install on your own system. So say for example, you've got some web app that you want to attack. If you get access to the source code, then put it on your own server and attack that. Hey, you're basically legally it's a lot more clear cut because you're just testing the security of some software, uh, and you know it's your own server and you know it's all good. Um, for the most part. Um, so if that's what the case is, then you can contact a security representative within the company. Uh, and there's a template that you can fill in that, um, that I can give, give you access to. Um, and if you don't hear back from them within a day or so, you might try calling them again uh, or contacting them again and give them a bit of a nudge. Um, CC me into all this communication, please. Um, and then you can apply for a CVE. Um, and you can put that on your resume um, and you complete this form to get yourself a, a CVE. Uh, and if the vendor disputes, uh, basically as part of that message that you take from the template, it gives them a deadline, like a time limit, um, uh, which is 60 days before you disclose it publicly. If they dispute that, then you can go to um, a CERT which is a third party that can do the disclosure. So basically to remove the legal liability from yourself, you can find a third party that will basically do the releasing of information. So if the vendor is disputing you and say, no, we need more time than that, or they just basically say, no, we're not going to fix it and don't tell anyone about it, or you, you know, we'll sue you or whatever, you can go to CERT and then they will deal with the company on your behalf. And then after the time's passed, you know, if they haven't disputed the fact that, you know, when you've explained what you're going to do, you can start posting publish about, uh, publicly about it. But you give them that time to fix the problem. Now, the complication comes when you are looking at live websites. Because from the law's point of view, like legally, if you're attacking someone else's servers without permission, you're basically, you're breaking the law. You're acting illegally pretty much as soon as you start doing anything that you haven't got permission to do. So basically, I suggest you don't do that. I'm not a lawyer, and my, if you want to not end up in any kind of like problem, troubles, don't attack live servers that aren't yours. Right? That's my um, official you know, position for you guys. You, got, you have your own like, take legal responsibility for what you're doing. Having said that, bug bounties are um, some companies will basically publish a policy where they will basically give you permission to test the security of their systems. So, for example, Facebook, Google, um, like Amazon, most of the big like tech technology companies will have a public um, disclosure policy that describes basically they'll give you permission to test 
certain parts of their websites and services, as long as you agree to um, responsibly disclose, which basically you are on their terms now, you can't set any time limits because, hey, without their permission you're acting illegally. So you look at what their policies say, they'll tell you how, how you need to behave, but on the plus side, there are quite a lot of bug bounty programs that will basically, they'll pay you if you find security problems. As long as you're acting ethically and, and you act according to their policies, which includes basically not telling anyone else what you're doing and report to them when you find something, um, that it's a way that you can make some money. So there are websites like HackerOne and BugCrowd that basically aggregate lists of all the um, companies that have bug bounty programs. You can log in and create yourself an account and um, they basically they can do some level of mediation but from some things that I've read they're not always very active in their medi mediation. They're kind of a bit hands off really. They're not likely to get in and settle a legal dispute or anything like that but they can provide some communication um, uh, help. I guess as a warning I'll mention that like Facebook publish a uh, um, bug bounty program details and previously they've sued people that claim to have been um, behaving according to those policies but Facebook have said they were out of scope from those policies because they were basically trying to um, attack staff accounts which is not within the scope for example so you do need to be careful that you aren't doing you're just doing what they are giving you permission to do but if you do you can make some money so <clears throat> so the average bag, so this is some data from HackerOne um, from, a, from a couple of reports that they've published and I've pulled some things out which I think you will find um, interesting, right? So for a critical vulnerability, which probably to be honest is not the kind of vulnerability you're going to find at first, but if you find a critical vulnerability, um, the average amount they would pay out was 1923 US dollars. That's a fair amount. That's at least a grand in pounds, um, which has been going up over time. Uh, and so there are the top performing bug bounty programs award hackers an average of $50,000 a month with some paying nearly um, 900,000 US dollars like each program pays that out to people each, each year. Um, and as an example of maybe the be one of the better examples is Google Chrome where if you can now find a, a critical security vulnerability in Google Chrome, the web browser, they will pay you up to $100,000 for one single vulnerability. So um, and the reason they can afford to do that is because it doesn't happen very often. Because over time, they've increased the bug bounty rewards um, and it, less and less are being discovered because so many people are testing it and looking for security problems. Sure, they still come up every now and then, but the amount of time it will take you to find one of those is probably not a good place to start, right? So basically, if, if I was going to suggest to you guys, if you were thinking of doing bug bounties, to start off actually with the companies that pay the least, because they're probably the ones that are most likely to have security problems. So you, you, if you're like just starting to want to start off, look across what the, pro, the, the um, bug bounty programs are, Find the one that's paying out the least amount uh, and try and actually start with those websites because they're probably the least um, confident that their systems are secure. So, also in your favor is that 90% of bug bounty um, hackers, like registered with HackerOne, are under 35 years old. Uh, and 26% of students like yourselves um, and yeah that's from another report that they've that they published also however bug bounties are the exception so most websites don't have a bug bounty so if you're just browsing the web and go hey I bet you I can break this website well first of all probably they don't have a bug bounty so if you try and break it you're breaking the law um, but yeah, so 94% of the top traded, publicly traded companies don't publish vulnerability disclosure policies. So, you know, you, you're 
basically, then they don't give you permission to test their systems. The ones that do are mostly technology companies. So there are other industries that, ha that have um, websites um, that have disclosure policies. So for example, of all of the restaurants, I think, Starbucks is the only one that has a um, bug bounty program of any kind. Um, so yeah. But if you look per industry, you can see cross-site scripting is the most common one to be found, the vulnerability that's found the most, um, followed by improper authentication, uh, which is kind of related to this week's topic, um, and you know, other things that we'll cover as we go on with the degree. So <clears throat> if you've got access to the source code, um, you can do manual code review. So you can actually read the source code um, basically, for every website, you've got access to the client software, right? Because it's running on your computer. So all the JavaScript code you can get. And depending on how much they've tried to make that difficult for you, so they might have obfuscated the JavaScript, so it's harder to read. But generally, you get that stuff. You don't normally get the web server side of it, unless it's open source software. Um, but just generally, it applies for any software that you want to look for security problems in. If you've got the, so the source code, you can do static analysis, which is where you so use techniques to basically automatically analyze your code. And regardless of whether or not you've got the source code, you can do reverse engineering. So for example, you can take a binary file, so not so much talking about web security anymore, but if you've got a .exe file, for example, you can reverse engineer that to get access to the source code. Um, and you can also do binary static analysis uh, where you're doing static analysis against a program. Um, or you can do fuzzing, which is where we basically do some like randomized testing. So static analysis is, is like a helpful way of automatically looking through code. It's really good for detecting like patterns in source code that typically lead to, lead to security problems. So for websites, there's um, ESLint. Uh, if you guys went to B-Sides Leads, um, and even if you didn't, because I'm pretty sure the video has been published on YouTube, uh, one of our previous students, Lewis Ardern, actually gave a presentation where he talked about using static code analysis on JavaScript. Um, so you might want to check that out. Um, but uh, you can also use static analysis to look for like buffer overflows, memory errors, and things like that in like typical like uh, C code, for example. And um, some tools have quite a high, po high false positive rate, so it tells you there's a bunch of errors when actually there's not any security problems. But they also don't detect any, everything, so there's like false, um, false uh, negatives as well. So fuzz testing is where we basically feed in variations of, of the input to try and break things. So we're trying to uncover unexpected behavior by feeding in uh, stuff that the program's not expecting. Um, and it's used, it's really good for finding new security vulnerabilities and it, regardless of whether or not you've got access to the source code. So there's a bunch of different approaches you can take to fuzzing from basically just feeding in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to like randomly generating strings as input. Uh, and when we're coming to websites, we o OWASP Zap does have a bunch of features that you can use to fuzz with. So where you would, um, you know, be typing something in, you can automate it typing different stuff in by basically using the fuzz feature within OWASP Zap um, or whatever web proxy you're using to generate different kinds of input, and that will be helpful. For example, in last week's task, where you were um, looking through bank accounts to try and like check how much money they had, you can automate that using like a fuzz, like fuzz testing. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can get to the fuzz feature within OWASP. Ah. So I'm just going to really quickly try and run through this demo, but hopefully it'll go well. Um, so let's have a look. So here we go. <clears throat> okay, so yeah. it's not a good start. Hello, 
So we'll start up our web proxy. And we'll just refresh this page because probably the certificate will have changed. So we'll accept that. So one of the challenges that you guys were working on last week <coughs> was this challenge here um, where you are transferring money around different accounts. And uh, so we'll sign in. I think this is on the same server I was using before. Okay. So we've logged in. We've got a thousand euros or whatever it is in our account. We need, we need 5 million euros to pass this challenge. So as you guys figured out, um, when you refresh your balance, um, you can see that the request that goes through basically includes the account number that it's requesting the balance of. And then the <coughs> response basically says um, the balance. So. The, if we want to um, solve the challenge, I mean, you can also, when you try and send money, so I want to send, say I'm going to send two euros to account one. Uh, I can see if I refresh my balance, I've got two euros less. And if I, uh, what am I doing? Um, if I look here, um, the request that goes through basically specifies where the money's coming from, and because you know there's not really anything, the server's not doing anything to actually verify that this that I have permission to do that. I can just change who the sender is and the receiver is to basically get someone else to send their money to me. But the challenge here is figuring out where the money is to send it to myself. So one way that I can like automate that searching for money because you can literally uh, like manually do it. Um, so we we saw before. So we can do refresh balance. And I want to check how much money like account two has. Um, and then that will basically <clears throat> tell me if account two also has um, 1,000 euros. Uh, but it's going to take a while to transfer like all of that money across. So I want some automated way of like looking through all of them. So one way I can do that is to, um, so this was the, uh, the, the refresh thing. So from here, you can basically fuzz. Uh, and now I can ask it to basically fuzz that variable. So I can basically add a variable, which is a number. Um, and I want it to be to basically count all the way from one to say account number 200. I want it to go up by one each time. You can see here it's just going to go one, two, three, five, six, seven, nine, ten, all the way up to 200. So that sounds that looks quite good. Uh, and then you can just click start fuzzer, and it will basically it's just run through and it's done that all those 200 requests. Um, and I can now look through and quickly see how much money is in each of those accounts. If I look at the responses, I can see, well, the fir first one has three euros because I gave them two um, and so on. And I can basically look down here and see that account does it actually doesn't exist. Um, and yeah, so if you look down, you'll see you'll find some that actually have more money in it. Uh, and so you can uh, then transfer that out. And if you do that a few times, you'll end up with enough money. So that is just to demonstrate that you can uh, basically use fuzzers, but you can do other things as well. So that was like a, 
because all we wanted to do is put different numbers in. But you can also fuzz with strings. Um, so for example, if I wanted to, instead of sending numbers, I want to send like a bunch of different um, like texts. I can, for example, try and, um, I don't know, cause a, uh, say a, um, let's see, say SQL injection. Um, and run that. And now it's probably not going to succeed because it's not the point of this exercise, but you can see what it's actually sending now are all these different, so it's saying account number equals all this stuff because it's trying to cause a buffer of a um, SQL injection. So it's now sending a bunch of stuff um, related to that. So yeah, you can do all sorts of clever things with that to try to break things. So that's the end of the first part of the, um, the lecture. Anyone got any questions about about that? No? Okay.